Hi there, my name is Chris Harris, now I'm from AllowyTutors.com and in this video we're going to be looking at carbon-13 NMR. So just briefly, we're going to be looking at carbon-based molecules, so organic molecules. We're going to be looking at their respective carbon-13 NMR spectra. We're also going to be looking at uh, electron shielding and its effect on something called chemical shift. And we're also going to be looking at a substance called TMS and what role it plays in, in, the, um, in NMR. So it is important that some of the um, terms I'm going to use in this video will require a, a basic knowledge of how an NMR machine works. So um, if you don't really know how the NMR machine works, then I strongly advise that you uh, look at the video that I've made on how it works first before you, before you see this. So uh, if you want to watch that video, just click on the link below, uh, you can see it there. Okay, so first of all, we're going to look at the title, which is carbon-13. So we have atoms which are uh, or have an odd number of nuclei, and this means that uh, the NMR machine can actually detect them. So these nuclei are uh, effectively shielded by electrons that surround them, and obviously this is what these carbon atoms will have. And effectively, the more electron shielding we have, then the less affected they are by um, the magnetic field. Um, and so this can either be the magnetic field in the NMR machine or magnetic fields by neighbouring atoms as well. And that's what we're going to mainly focus on is the, um, is the effect that neighbouring atoms have on, um, on the shielding of these carbon atoms. Um, and effectively, the less affected, um, the uh, less, uh, sorry, the more shielding they have, then the less affected they are by uh, a magnetic field and therefore the chemical shift is a lot lower. So in other words, the less shielding the carbon has, uh, the more affected they are by the magnetic field and therefore they'll shift a lot further up. So when we're talking about the word chemical shift, what do we actually mean? Well, if we look at the NMR spectra, and we'll come back to these in a minute as well, uh, then you can see that we have a shift uh, number on here. It's measured in ppm at the bottom. So you can see that it starts back to front as well. So we've got a zero at one end and it goes up, in this case with carbon-13, it goes up in 20, 40, 60, 80, etc. So they're quite large numbers relative to proton NMR, which is slightly um, smaller. And you can see these are the shift numbers and these tell us basically um, show us the carbon environment that the NMR machine is picking up and it's telling us what this carbon environment is next door to. So if it's next door to an element that might, um, for example, pull electrons away from this carbon atom and means that it's less shielded, it will mean that it will be shifted a lot further up the NMR spectra. If it's not affected by the, if, it's, if it's a carbon atom that's not next to an atom that's de-shielding it effectively, then it won't shift as high. And I'll go through this as an example as well to do with um, alcohols. So if we have a look at this one here first, now you can see that we have three carbons, and all these carbons obviously have the same number of electrons in their shells, because they're just they're carbon atoms. So and they're in a molecule. So in terms of the atom itself, the shielding really should be the same. But actually, Depending on what's next door to it will depend on how much shielding we have. And atoms which are electronegative, so for example oxygen, are actually de-shielding. What they're doing is they're pulling electrons away from the carbon atom that are next to it or near it, uh, and they're effectively pulling electrons away from it and effectively removing the shielding effect. And because the shielding is being removed or de-shielded, then what that means is the... Um, the chemical shift will actually move further up. So it's a little bit like, um, the best way to describe it is if we imagine this OH is like a bottle of perfume or aftershave or deodorant or whatever, and it has a particular smell. Now, if we have the, if we imagine the OH bit is a bit like the bottle of perfume and the carbons are like three people standing in a line, now obviously the first person to smell the perfume when it's being sprayed or the deodorant uh, would be the first person here. So this one's going to be more uh, influenced by that smell of perfume because it's right next door to the bottle. But as we go further along the line, obviously the people are going to smell it later. So this person's going to smell it after this person, and then this person is going to smell it last because they're further away from the bottle. So they're not influenced by it as much. Now it's the same principle with, uh, with molecules as well, except obviously we're not talking about smells and perfume, we're talking about the ability for this molecule to pull electrons towards itself. 
And obviously the carbon right next door to it is going to be influenced a lot more than the carbon next to it. And then that's going to be influenced uh, even more than the carbon after that as well. Um, and this is important because this is where we talk about something called environments, carbon environments. And you can see because these are actually getting further away, the one that's going to be in the, um, the kind of closest environment to the oxygen is the carbon. This is a little bit further away and this is further away still. So in terms of the NMR spectrum, we'll actually get three separate peaks. Uh, and we call these carbon environments. So we need to look at this molecule and assign it to the correct peak. So we're going to do this in different colours. So we're going to look at this one here first. Now look at this carbon. Uh, this carbon is very near to the OH. Therefore, because it's right next door to an electronegative element, it's going to be de-shielded more than any of the other two. And remember, a molecule, uh, sorry, an atom that has got very little shielding, uh, is it going to be affected more by the NMR, by the magnetic field of the NMR machine? And so therefore, it's going to shift further up. So we can say that this carbon here is called this peak, which is the one that's furthest up on the right at ppm 60. Now you can look in your carbon 13 table and you can see that uh, somewhere around the 60 region would signify a carbon that's next door to an OH group. If we look at the next carbon along, you can see this carbon, carbon number two. This one is a little bit further away from the OH, so it won't be shifted as much because it'll have plenty of shielding. So this one is going to be attributed to this second peak here, so the next one that's shifted along. And then if we obviously look at the last one, there's only one peak left, which is this one here. Uh, this one is going to be attributed to that peak. Because it's shifted very little, it's the furthest away from the oxygen, so it's not influenced as much. But you can see we have um, three different carbon environments. We also have a peak here at zero, which is TMS, which I'll come on to in a minute. Okay, if we look at the same um, uh, MR molecules, so it's an isomer effectively, this is a uh, propan uh, 2-ol, so we've got the same mass, but this is where NMR is brilliant. Because in mass spectrometry, a mass spectrometer wouldn't be able to detect really the difference, uh, not well enough, uh, to be able to work out what this molecule is. It isn't as easy as that. Whereas NMR can tell you straight away the difference between the isomers. So if we have a look here, again, if we go back to that analogy with the perfume, you can see we've got an OH here. This is like the perfume. The first person to smell it would be this person in the middle because they're right next to the OH that's literally joined onto it. So this is going to be one environment. So if I highlight that in red, that's going to be one environment there. Now because this is right next door to the um, OH group, it's going to be de-shielded more by the OH. And this peak here is going to be the peak that's this carbon is because of this peak. Uh, this peak is here because of this carbon, which is right next door to the OH. So this is one environment. But interestingly, this is a little bit different to this one, because if you look at these two carbons here, these ones are equally or as equal distance away from this OH and are, in essence, um, affected in the same way. And if you look immediately what's right to them, they're both effectively symmetrical. There's some symmetry there. So the NMR machine detects these carbons as the same environment. They can both smell this OH at the same time, and there's nothing else either side of these either, so therefore they're in the same environment. So if I draw these in green, so I'll just draw them a bit like uh, a bit like this. So you can see these two carbons are effectively in the same environment, and the NMR machine just picks up them as the same environment. So you just get one peak. So notice you only get two peaks because of this molecule with this one, because these are in the same environment, as opposed to three peaks for this one, because they're in three separate environments. So this is important, um, because it allows us to distinguish, like I say, between the two isomers. And um, again, as we're coming to this last thing on the end here, which is the peaks at zero, um, we need something uh, like a reference chemical to uh, measure how well these things shift up the scale. And we use something called TMS, which stands for tetramethylsilane. Uh, and effectively, it's a silicon atom in the middle. And we've got three C, uh, four CH3 groups sorry, surrounding the silicon. 
but you can see these carbons are all bonded to the same silicon atoms, so we have a lot of symmetry here. So NMR machine will pick this up as one environment. They're all bonded to the same silicon atom, so not one of them are different. So it's a bit like the perfume bottle in the middle, and all four of them will smell it at the same time, so they're all influenced in the same way. Now, we use this as like a, a reference. So it's effectively like when you, uh, if you were going to get a pair of bathroom scales, you would always set it to zero first, then stand on the scales. And um, this is effectively what we're doing with an NMR machine, except we can't adjust it to zero. We need to put a chemical in, then adjust the NMR machine so that this chemical is at the zero line. And then we, uh, once the machine is effectively calibrated, we then put in our molecules, our carbon compounds like this. Now, the reasons why we use this is because this chemical is inert. So if we mix it with these, um, it's not going to react with it, which is good. It's not going to affect the structure of the molecule. A strong peak is produced because we have um, a lot of carbons in the same environment. So there's no mistake that this peak is TMS. And also, um, there's very little polarity in this molecule. It's one of the boring molecules you'll see in chemistry. Um, there's no polarity in there, uh, or very little. So there's loads of shielding around these carbons here. So therefore, you'll get a very, very low chemical shift. And so therefore, the peak that this, this will create on an NMR machine is going to be well over to the right anyway, completely different from most other organic molecules that you could put in there to analyze. Um, but that's it. Hope that helps. Bye.